we'll start. Uh, you know how to do that? Okay. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you again by the precious blood of the Lamb on this your holy Shabbat. What an honor it is to be able to study your Torah, to learn your ways. Father, we just ask that you would teach us what your love is all about today. And we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. In the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. So this is called Loving the Father. This is basically the message I taught at Sukkot, so it'll be a uh, review for you, Casey, but pretty much everybody, nobody else here has heard it, except for Solomon, too, everybody that was at Sukkot. But um, it's the neglected part of the gospel. We know that God is love, and we know he loves us, but we have really missed it when it comes to loving him back in the way that he wants to be loved, and so that's what we're going to study. He's given us a great commission, and we're going to look at the one in Mark to start with. Chapter 16, starting at verse 15, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those that believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. They were obedient. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. He did it back then, but guess what? He's doing it today in the same way. He said in, in John 14 that the works that I do will you do and greater works because I'm going to the Father. And it hasn't changed. So he's wanting us to do these signs. Notice these are the signs that will follow them that believe. These are not the signs of the apostles or the prophets. These are the signs of the believers that they preach to. And so he wants us all to walk in this power. He wants us all to go out and, and preach this gospel. Now, we were also given a place to start in spreading this full gospel. And Acts 1.6 gives us this information. Therefore, when they had come together... They asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put under his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea, in Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. So he wants us to start preaching at Jerusalem. There was a reason for that. Jerusalem was the center of true worship. And the people there, the Jews, the southern kingdom of Judah, which is why they're called Jews today, they were the ones that were given the Torah, that the Messiah came through. And so he wants to reconcile his people first. That is his focus. He wants everybody to be saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he wants us to start at Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, up a little further north where the Gentiles were, and then to the ends of the earth. Now, the reason we start there, he explains a little bit more in Deuteronomy 32, verse 17. This is talking about Israel after they rebelled. They sacrificed the demons who are not God, to gods hitherto unknown to them, to newcomers of yesterday whom their ancestors had never respected. You forget the rock who fathered you, the God who made you. You no longer remember. Yahweh saw it, and in anger he spurned his sons and his daughters. I shall hide my face from them, he said, and see what will become of them. For they are a deceitful brood, children with no loyalty in them. They have roused me to jealousy with a non-God. They have exasperated me with their idols. In my turn, I shall rouse them to jealousy with a non-people. I shall exasperate them with a foolish nation. So Israel is called the people. Ha'am. They're the people of God. But yet, they rejected him, and that's why we have a new covenant now. So this is what Paul explains and what actually motivated him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He understood this truth. So in Romans 1.16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. So God wants to save everybody, but there is a specific order. He wants us to go to the Jew first because he made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he is not going to forget that covenant. He is not going to forget their descendants. Romans 11.1, 1, he says, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham. 
of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, the southern kingdom was made up of Judah and Benjamin and then some of the Levites, and then the rest of the Levites were in the north and all the other tribes. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew, skipping to verse 5. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Verse 7, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Skipping to verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. This is why he reached out to the Gentiles. He's provoking his children. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, and their Failure, riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. So Paul's motive preaching to the Gentiles is to provoke the Jews, his brothers after the flesh. Verse 15, for if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. It's conditional. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. We have to abide in the vine of Yeshua. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the wild of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentile has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. So he made a covenant with the fathers, the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the covenants are not ending. Now, the covenants were made with Israel. There weren't any covenants made with Gentiles for salvation. The only one made with Gentiles was the covenant of Noah, and it was made with all living creatures on the earth, a promise not to drown everything again with a flood. So this includes the new covenant. Look at who it's made with here in Hebrews chapter 8. He starts explaining about true worship, about what goes on in the throne room, about what Yahweh himself desires. Hebrews 8.1. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. See, the one Moses made was just a copy of what the father has going on in his throne room. He could have had anything he wanted. He chose to have a tabernacle up there that he raised. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the Torah. It was Aaron and his sons, descendants. I mean, that was our Torah portion this week about who was going to be the priesthood. And nobody from Judah was allowed to be a priest. So this does not follow the, the, the things of the Torah. But the Torah was copied after what this actually is. He is the true high priest that Aaron's priesthood was copied after. 
Verse 5, who served the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Those basically, Vern, are the expanded notes from this message. You can take that home with you. <clears throat> but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he also is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now notice there's no Gentiles included in here because there's no covenant made with Gentiles. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says Yahweh. We just read about that. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. So what are the writings of the new covenant that Yahweh writes? It's his Torah. The instructions didn't change. They were just internalized. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none of his brothers, saying, No, Yahweh, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. So the writer of Hebrews is quoting Jeremiah. Now, this was written in Greek, so it doesn't say Torah. It says nomos, where that word law is. And that's kind of a limited Greek word. But in Jeremiah, it uses the word. It's almost the same language. We're not going to read it for the sake of time. But... It uses the word Torah. He writes his Torah on our hearts, puts it in our minds. So the writings of the new covenant, according to Yahweh, the same writings that we always had. The new covenant is all about us being born again and having his spirit inside of us now to empower us, as we're going to see later, to walk in obedience to his Torah like we couldn't do under the old covenant. The old covenant, the Torah condemned us. It pointed out our flaws and our shortcomings. We couldn't keep it because we weren't born again. The Torah is spiritual. Paul points out in Romans 7. But he said, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. A carnal man can't keep a spiritual thing. You've got to be born again. You've got to be born of his spirit. So like I said, there's no covenant made with Gentiles except the covenant of Noah. If a Gentile wanted to be in covenant with Yahweh, he has to die to his old identity and be born again of the spirit, a new creation. You're no longer a Gentile when that happens. Ephesians 2.8, Paul explains this. He says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You can't earn your salvation. But then he goes on and says, For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he wants us to walk in them, but just by walking in them will not get you saved. That's the whole point he's pointing out. Same works that won't save you. He does want you to walk in them, but it's after you're born again. After you become a spiritual person, so you have the ability to do it. Going on, verse 11, remember, therefore, or therefore, remember that you once Gentiles, which means no longer, once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time before you were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Now, notice covenants is plural. It's not just the old covenant. There's multiple covenants made with Israel having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. Brought near what? The commonwealth of Israel, the God of Israel, and the covenants of Israel. We're no longer strangers, verse 19 goes on and says, but fellow citizens with the household of saints, no longer Gentiles. So former Gentiles are grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. And here's a second witness in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away with these dumb idols, however you were led. But they're not Gentiles anymore. They're born again, born of the Spirit. So just as we saw in Romans 11 above, the former Gentiles are grafted into the good olive tree, the commonwealth of Israel, also known as the body of Messiah. Now, many of the natural branches were broken off because of unbelief in Yeshua as being the Messiah. They can also be grafted back in again if they embrace Yeshua as our Messiah. So this is not a permanent blindness he's talking about here. 
The important thing that we need to notice is that the good olive tree never changed its identity. It didn't become a church. It stayed the same. And it actually started back in Exodus chapter 20 at Mount Sinai. That's when we received the book of the covenant. Basically, it was our ketubah. It was our betrothal. And we haven't been married yet. He talks about his wife in Isaiah and these other places. And that was considered a wife even when you were betrothed, which is why Joseph and Mary, they were basically considered married because he had already betrothed her. They hadn't had relations yet. They hadn't actually had the wedding ceremony. But he had to give her a writ of divorcement in order to put her away because that, that was a binding contract, the betrothal. And so that happened at Mount Sinai. That's when we became the people of Yahweh. So it remains the commonwealth of Israel, the one new man of Ephesians 2. The new creation of 2 Corinthians 5.17 is the commonwealth of Israel, the body of Messiah. It's not the Jew and Gentile put together. It's the born again former Jew and former Gentile that are now the, the supernatural fused with the creator, new creation that never existed before. It's a whole new thing. That's why it's a new man, new all the way around. Now, there's still Jews and Gentiles. Remember that list Paul gave us, the Jews, the Gentiles, and then the assembly. So let's look at another aspect of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 18. And Yeshua came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, with the authority he was given, he's given us a command, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And as I said, what Yeshua taught is what we're supposed to teach in the Great Commission. Not what we believe that Paul taught or Martin Luther or what we learned wherever. It's what Yeshua taught. That's what he is very specific here in explaining. He had the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He explained the truth when he was here. He lived the truth. He was the prototype. He was the example that we're to follow. 1 John 2, 6 says, if we say that we are his, we should walk even as he walked. And the context is in the commandment keeping. So let's take a closer look at the gospel message that Yeshua taught. He did not instruct us to teach what Paul taught, like I said, and what Martin Luther taught or what we learned at Bible school. or to teach what he taught and only what he taught. Now, we're warned very seriously by Peter about Paul's writings and the necessity to be very mature before we attempt to use his teachings. It's in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, is written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them as the, of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Almost everything you wrote, really. <laughs> which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they also do the rest of the scriptures. Paul can't be understood by himself. It has to be taken with the context of what was given before. It has to be understood through the Torah and the Tanakh. Now, Tanakh is an acronym in, from Hebrew. It means the Torah, stands for the Torah, the Nevi'im or the prophets, and then the Kituvim. It's, it's what Christianity is labeled the Old Testament. But that, there's two pages in our Bible that were inspired by the devil himself, and that's the page before Genesis 1-1 that says Old Testament, and the page before Matthew 1-1 that says New Testament. The scriptures are eternal. They are forever settled in heaven, and they're just as true today as they were back then. There is an old covenant, and there's a new covenant, but it has nothing to do with the scriptures. The scriptures will describe them, but the scriptures are eternal. And Yeshua walked them and lived them, and Paul did too. So if anyone didn't heed this warning, he might come up with an alternate religious system that Yahweh never desired. 2 Timothy 3.14 but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures. What scriptures did Timothy have from a child? It wasn't the New Testament. It's what we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh. That was the only Bible he had. So Paul's telling him, don't forget it. Remember this. That from a childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Messiah Yeshua. No. How's that? It doesn't mention Jesus in, in the Old Testament. Well, yet it does, not by name maybe, but he said to the Pharisees, if you don't believe Moses, you'd believe me because Mo Moses wrote of me. It was all about the Messiah. starts out the very first verse of the Bible. I'm, it's not in this lesson, but it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrew, it says, Bereshit bara et, 
Now the word et is aleph tav. It's the first and the last letters of the Hebrew language, and it's not translated because it's actually a part of speech. It's the direct, uh, the indicator of the direct object of the sentence. But yet there's a hidden meaning there because in Revelations, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega. And he wasn't speaking Greek. He was speaking to a Hebrew man. He would have said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. He's explaining that I'm right there in the very beginning. In the beginning was the Aleph and the Tav because he was there. God said, let there be light. And there was light. But yet the sun, moon, and the stars weren't created for another couple days. He's talking about Yeshua. Yeshua is that light. And John, first, John, the first chapter, talks about he is that light that lights every man that comes into the world. So he's at the very beginning. In the first sentence of the Bible, all through the first chapter, all through every bit, the seed of the woman in Genesis chapter 3. I mean, it's, it's all about the Messiah. Prophet like Moses, Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. He's all through it. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may com be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So you can't be that without the complete Bible. That's what Paul's saying. You've got to start at the beginning. You've got to lay the proper foundation and build on it from there. So as, as I said, when Paul wrote this to Timothy, the apostolic writings, what has been mislabeled the New Testament, had not been compiled yet. It would be the fourth century before it was ever even canonized, and they figured out what they wanted in the Bible. So 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent, or in the King James it says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, but it means be diligent. A worker that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So how do we rightly divide? Well, you start from the beginning and make sure everything lines up as you study it out. You don't start three-fourths of the way into it and then try to figure out how it all fits together because it doesn't make sense that way. You end up with an alternate religious system that he never desired. So Paul understood a principle that he was trying to pass along to Timothy. To understand what Paul meant by this, we have to go back to the Torah. Now, Torah, again, is the word used in the Hebrew Bible for the instruction of our Heavenly Father to his children. And it literally means teaching, instruction, or direction in Hebrew. The Torah is also the word that our fathers used for the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, specifically. Now, Yeshua in John 10 says, uh, isn't it written in your law that uh, it says you are God? So he includes the Psalms. The Torah can include all the instruction of Scripture, but specifically it is the first five books. Now, about 250 years before the birth of Yeshua, there was a library in Alexandria, Egypt, and they wanted a copy of the Torah in Greek that they could read. And so they commissioned these 70 rabbis to make this translation called the Septuagint. And the word that they used for Torah when they translated it was namos in the Greek. And that's the closest word that the Greek has to it. And that's, that's the word that it, it is in whenever you look at law in the Greek in the New Testament. That's the word that's there. And it doesn't carry the same meaning as the Hebrew word, the teaching or instruction. It just basically means law. And, and the Torah was the civil law of Israel, so it is appropriate. But it doesn't carry the full understanding that the word Torah actually does. It's tricky to translate from one language to another. And there's just not sometimes words that just aren't compatible. So they did the best they could, but you've got to dig back into the Hebrew to really understand what it's saying in the Greek to get the context of it. So in Deuteronomy 4.1, this is the principle that Paul understood. Now... O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I will teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which Yahweh God of your fathers has given you. So statutes and judgments, he's telling us. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh, it's the Lord in the King James, your God. Anytime you see the Lord spelled out that way, the large capital L and the smaller capital O-R-D, you know it's the Hebrew letters yod Hey vav Hey. It's God's proper name. Some people call him Jehovah, but there was no J sound until like 500 years ago. But Yehovah or Yahweh, some scholars believe it's Yahweh. That's why we use Yahweh. I mean, you can't prove it. It doesn't really matter, but we know it's not the Lord. It is Yah, if nothing else. So we're to keep the commandments of Yahweh, which I command you. This is the foundation. So he forbids us to add to his Torah or to take anything away from it. Now, this is a very crucial understanding if we're going to correctly interpret the rest of Scripture. Now, he gives us a second witness in Deuteronomy 13, 
Uh, actually, this is the last verse of chapter 12 in most English Bibles, in the, the Hebrew Tanakh, and in this particular, the New Jerusalem Bible, it's the first verse of chapter 13. It says, whatever I am now commanding you, you must keep and observe, adding nothing to it and taking nothing away. And then he goes on, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you, offering you some sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder comes about, it happens. And if he says to you, let us follow other gods, hitherto unknown to you, and serve them, you must not listen to that prophet's words or that dreamer of dreams. Yahweh your God is testing you to know if you love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Yahweh your God is the one whom you must follow. Him you must fear. His commandments you must keep. His voice you must obey. Him you must serve. To him you must hold fast. That prophet or that dreamer of dreams must be put to death. This is a serious thing with Yahweh. Since he has preached apostasy from Yahweh your God. When you turn away from his commandments, you turn away from him. Because he and his word are one. Yeshua is the word. <clears throat> who brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the place of slave labor. And he would have diverted you away from the which Yahweh your God has commanded you to walk. You must banish this evil from among you. Now, obviously, if somebody started preaching about Allah or Buddha or somebody like that, we would know that's, that's garbage. But what about in Judaism? They claim to be serving the same God that we serve. They call him Hashem. They won't even say his name Yahweh because they believe it's too sacred. But yet in 1 John 2, it says if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father either. But yet they're worshiping a God, so what is this God they're worshiping? Well, it's not Yahweh because they don't have the Father. So it's basically another golden calf. This is the false God that is so subtle that we don't even realize he's a false God. Well, there's certain denominations in Christianity that do the same thing. Paul talks about that there are those that have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof from such turn away. He prophesies about another Jesus in 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. There's this other Jesus that has another spirit, and it's going to deceive a lot of people, so he warns us about it. So these are the false gods that are tricky to spot. You've got to really be keeping your eye out for it in order to not be deceived. It's not the supernatural that's the proof. It's walking in obedience. The spirit of Yahweh will always lead you in the dire direction of his commandments, into obedience, because that's what brings the blessing. That's what gives the Father glory. Signs and wonders are not the proof of a true believer or a true prophet. Obedience to the Father's commandments came, contained in his Torah is the proof. So the Torah is our foundation, and it was given to us through Moses in a very unique way. Exodus 33, 11, Yahweh would talk to Moses face to face as a man talks to his friend. He didn't do that with anybody else. Numbers 12, 1. Miriam and Aaron, too, criticized Moses over the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had indeed married a Cushite woman. Ethiopian is what some translation says. It was a racial thing. They, they got incensed about this. God's not against intermarial races. He's a, against interreligious relationships because you are to have no other gods and no relationship with anybody else that has another god. So they said, is Moses the only one through whom Yahweh has spoken? Has he not spoken through us too? I mean, they were prophets also. Miriam was a prophet, as it calls her that. Aaron was the high priest, and he was a prophet too, I guess. So Yahweh heard this. Now Moses was extremely humble, the humblest man on earth. Suddenly Yahweh said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out, all three of you, to the tent of meeting. They went, all three of them, and Yahweh descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent. He called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. Yahweh said, listen to my words. If there is a prophet among you, I reveal myself to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. To him, my whole household is entrusted. To him, I speak face to face, plainly, and not in riddles. And he sees Yahweh's form. How then could you dare criticize my servant Moses? This is a question we could ask the most Christians today. Moses was the closest thing to the Messiah that we had before Yeshua ever even came. He walked with God in a way that was very, very unique. He received our Father's Torah through Yeshua. Now, most people don't understand this. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is given this history right before they stone him. And they ta he talks about this church in the wilderness 
because it was the true church. It's the same Greek word, ekklesia. It's the assembly that was with Moses in the wilderness who received the living oracles from this angel that was with him. Well, who was this angel? It was the angel of Yahweh. He was the only angel that would receive worship. He was the one that wrestled with Jacob and gave him the name Israel. And that uh, he, w he was always there. But he was the only angel that would receive worship because he was the only angel that was not created. He was the representative of Yahweh himself. It's what we call Yeshua. But he never gave his name in the Tanakh, not until he was born of a virgin. Then he finally revealed it. We've got a, a teaching on that as well, if you want more details. So the Torah is the direct instruction, and it was Yeshua that gave it to us. Those that want to just follow the commandments of Christ from the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, there's, there's Christians out there like that. The, the problem is the Sermon on the Mount started at Mount Sinai. That's when Yeshua gave us the Torah, so the sermon starts way back then, and that's the commandments that we're supposed to follow, the whole thing. It's the direct instructions of a loving father for his children. The Torah is not the Old Testament. The Torah is the writings of the new covenant the Father has written on our hearts, like we discussed, through his Holy Spirit. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-six, 36, it says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the Torah? And it's that one up there. Yeshua said, You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. They're the two main categories. The rest of the commandments fall under one of the two. Ten commandments are the same way. All the Ten Commandments either have to do with loving Yahweh or loving your neighbor. And the rest of the Torah is the same way. They're his details on how he wants us to do it. He talks about in one place, if you see your neighbor's ox wandering in the way, then go get the ox and take him back to your neighbor. That's a practical way of walking out love to your neighbor. If you don't know who it belongs to, take care of it until you can find its owner. There's just practical things of how we can walk in love. So all of the Torah is hanging on these two greatest commandments. And they all deal with loving our Father and loving our neighbor. And John 15 is a really neat picture of this. He's explaining salvation, and then he's explaining about love at the end. He says, I am the true vine. This is kind of a parallel passage to Romans 11. I'm the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So the first step is you've got to be born again. You've got to become a branch in Messiah Yeshua. Then you have to abide in him, and if you don't abide, he takes you away. Now how do we abide? Well, I don't really get into it in this teaching, but in 1 John chapter 2, it talks about, in verse 5, he who keeps his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. So when we're walking in obedience, we can know that we are in him. And his spirit bears witness, too. There's a scripture like that that talks about it. But the verses right before that says, whoever says, I know him and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. So we can know that we're in him through our obedience and the witness of his spirit as well. Um, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. Now who casts him out? Well, it says the Father removes him, so... You better, you better take a serious look at this and walk in obedience. Otherwise, the Father's going to eventually reject you. And they're cast out, thrown into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. So walking in obedience has to do with answered prayer, too. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. So this whole process, we've got to walk this whole thing out to be his disciples. As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. How do we do that? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Because they're all about love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, if he did it, the prototype, as our example to follow, why do we think that we can love the Father in any different way? There's really not a different way. 
you have to do it by keeping his commandments, just like Yeshua showed us. Otherwise, you're proving, if you go through John 14, it proves that you don't love him if you don't. The chapter right before this. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. It all goes back to obedience. It's all conditional on obedience because that's how we prove that we love him. That's how we abide in him. We have to stay plugged into the wall socket. If you pull the plug out, you're no longer connected to the juice. We have to keep plugged in, and we do it through obedience. That's the importance of it. So here Yeshua explains that he has commandments and that our Father has commandments as well. Now, Yeshua's commandments have to do with the second greatest command, loving our neighbors ourselves, primarily. They, they do overlap a little bit. Now, the Father's commandments are contained in his Torah and have to do with loving him. The parts of the Torah that are called the ceremonial parts that Christianity is mislabeled, those are the parts they reject. They like the moral laws, the don't sleep with your neighbor's wife and don't steal and don't lie and all that stuff. They accept that. But the parts about keeping Pentecost or keeping Passover and having a Sabbath meeting, they look at that as bondage. What it is, it's all about loving the Father. Remember Hebrews 8? It was all patterned after what goes on in the throne room. He set up what he wanted, and then he showed Moses, this is what you're to show them, and this is how they're going to love me, basically. So when you reject that part of his Torah, you're rejecting the way to love the Father. Now, there's going to be separate parts of the great white throne judgment. It's called the judgment seat of Christ in most Bibles, the judgment seat of Messiah. And we get two views of this in Matthew, and it has to do with the two greatest commands. We're going to be judged as how we loved our neighbor and how we loved our father. Matthew 25 deals with how we loved our neighbor primarily. And this is by loving our neighbor, we're loving Yeshua. This has to do with him. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Now notice, sheep and goats, they're both clean animals. Both of them could be used for Passover, either one. These are believers that he's judging. <clears throat> this is the judgment seat of Messiah. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, And assuredly I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it not to the least of one of these, you did it not to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous and the life eternal. So this is a pretty scary passage here. He's going to be judging his people. Judgment begins at the house of God. So this passage gives us the details of what to expect at the great white throne judgment. This reveals that we will indeed be judged in how we loved our neighbor and how we followed Yeshua's commandments. Now we get details on the judgment of how we loved our father when we look back at Matthew 7. Matthew 7, this is playing off that passage in Deuteronomy read. Deuteronomy 13 about the false prophets and how if they do a sign or a wonder and it comes to pass and we're to try them by their obedience. Do they lead us to obedience to scripture or away for following other gods that says that stuff's nailed to the cross and we don't have to do that anymore? 
Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, doing signs or wonders. But inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire because they're not abiding, just like we saw in John 15. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everybody that says the sinner's prayer, you could say, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my father, remember, it's always conditional. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and then done many wonders in your name? These guys thought they were all right. They were doing these things. They were loving their neighbor. They were casting out devils, raising the dead, healing the sick. They were doing the works that Yeshua did that showed love for your neighbor. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It says you workers of iniquity in the King James, but this is a more modern translation. It's that same word in Matthew 24. Because of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. The man of lawlessness in Ephesians 2, it's the same Greek word. It has to do with abolishing the Torah. Namos is the word in Greek for Torah. It means law. Anomos means against the law. Anomia means to have abolished the law. And that's what these guys have done with the ceremonial parts of the law. You throw that out, you, have no, longer, you no longer have the ability to love the Father by his definition. That's the danger in it. There's a parallel passage in 1 Corinthians 13 too. Though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so I could remove mountains or cast out devils or do mighty works, if I don't have love, I'm nothing. Now, why does he say, I never knew you? These guys were born again. They're doing these works by the spirit of Yahweh. God says Satan will not cast out Satan. It had to be done by his spirit. But in Ezekiel, there's a couple different places where it talks about if a righteous man walks righteously his whole life, but in the end turns from his righteousness and you warn him, and he repents, and he'll be good. But if he doesn't, his righteousness will not be remembered. In other words, he's going to have to say, I never knew you. So you can live your whole life right until the end and then turn away, and your righteousness is not going to even be remembered. So Yeshua is referring us back to the passage in Deuteronomy 13 about the false prophets and how the signs and the wonders are not the true sign of a true believer. Obedience to our Father's Torah is the sign that he's looking for. It's about loving the Father. The reason is, it's the ceremonial parts of the Torah that demonstrate our love for the Father. Talk is cheap. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He wants us to demonstrate it to him. We're going to be judged by how we kept both of the greatest commandments. We can't actually keep either command without our Father's definition for love contained in the details of his Torah. You can't make up your own definition. I mean, Christianity's tried it. Now they've got homosexual bishops in some of the denominations and, and transgender Baptist ministers down in Texas, and it's just, it's a, it's a mess. There's more divorce in the church now than there is in the world. They've left their foundation. Now there's a timing to the validity of all aspects of Torah, and, and some believers get confused in this. In Galatians 3.10 it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law. So who are those that are of the works of the law. It would be the Jews that he's talking about in Romans 9, 10, and 11. They're going about to s establish their own righteousness through works of the law. They rejected the Messiah. They're not born again. They're natural men trying to earn their salvation, basically. So those are the ones that are under the works of the law. They're the ones trying to earn it, and, and it condemns them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. We are all saved by faith, just like Abraham. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall find life in them. Actually, it has to do with life, and that goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it talks about in the last couple of verses that if you do these things, this will be righteousness for you. Messiah has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Messiah Yeshua, that we might receive the promises of the Spirit through faith. Now, 
David Ingalls sang a song, Abraham's blessing is mine. He quotes Deuteronomy 28. But you go back to Deuteronomy 28 and look, it says, he who does the things that are contained in the book of this law, then these blessings will come on you and overtake you. It's all about obedience. It's not just about being born again. Yeshua didn't do it so that we don't have to. He did it to show us what we're supposed to do. Then he gave us his spirit for that same reason. Now, brethren, verse 15, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Messiah. So he's talking about a singular seed, the Messiah that's promised to Abraham. Abraham and to his seed, singular, the promises were made to. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Messiah, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. So this is where Christianity says, see, it's done away with. The seed's already come, so there goes the law. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Now, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confirmed all under sin, that the promise by faith in Yeshua might be given to those who believe. So what was the promise that was made to Abraham and to the singular seed? Because if you can track that, you can figure out what he's talking about. You've got to go back to the Tanakh because he's using that as a reference. You can't just assume you understand what Paul's saying. We remember that warning. Well, in Genesis 15, 18, it says, In the same day Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham, Abraham saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So David and Solomon came very, very close to obtaining all of this land that Yahweh had promised. But they never were able to root out the Philistines out of that Gaza Strip. They never could possess the whole thing. Yeshua will do this when he returns, and then... He's going to teach us the Torah from Jerusalem. That's when the seed is going to come to whom the promise was made. It hadn't, didn't happen the first time. He didn't come as the lion of the tribe of Judah the first time. He came as the lamb that was going to lay down his life. And that's where a lot of us have missed it. The Jews missed it because they were looking for the king. They wanted to get out from under Roman oppression. Isaiah 2, 3 says, Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Yaakov, Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords. Now notice he's teaching the Torah and judging the nations. That's what we just looked at, Matthew 25. It's based on his instructions. That's what the standard's going to be. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And he gives us a second witness in Micah 4, 2. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the Torah shall go forth, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, it's interesting. In the future, he's going to be teaching the Torah. Willie George was one of the only ministers I ever heard who read Ezekiel and said, uh, I don't know if you guys realize it or not, but in the future kingdom, we're going to be doing animal sacrifice. It's pretty clear there. And he saw that. I, I, did, I didn't even realize it at the time, but it, it was pretty amazing. So Yeshua himself gives us a clear timetable for the validity of Torah. How long is it going to be with us? What's this seed? What's it all about? Matthew 5, 17. Don't think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So he's saying, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. So obviously fulfilling it can't be abolishing it because he's contrasting the two things here. But really, this is actually a Jewish idiom. 
to destroy the Torah in Yeshua's day meant that you were interpreting it wrongly. And to fulfill the Torah meant you were teaching it properly, which is what Yeshua did. But either way, it still remains the same. He says, for assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass. That's the timing he gives us for it. One jot or one tittle will on no means pass from the Torah till it's all fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Like we could eat pork now, like so many do. You break that command and teach others that you're going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That is if you make it, if you don't fall under that Matthew 7 where you've abolished it all. Just breaking one, though, will get you demoted to least. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, like I said, in, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, where the Shema is from, the two last two verses of that chapter says, if you do these things, it will be called, counted as righteousness for you. So there is a certain amount of righteousness that comes through obedience. That's part of it. The Pharisees understood that, but they didn't go far enough. You've got to exceed that. You can't just earn your righteousness by keeping the law. You have to be born again, and that's how. So you don't ignore what they did for righteousness because they had a certain amount of righteousness, but our righteousness has to exceed their righteousness. We have to be born again. They have to be born again if they're going to make it. So the Pharisees did have a form of righteousness, but it was not enough to obtain eternal life. This only comes through the blood of Yeshua. Our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees, like I said. This means that we must have the righteousness that they had obtained, but we have to have more than they had. Now look at Romans 6.15. Paul kind of explains this. He's bouncing it off of Deuteronomy 6, like I said. What then? Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So obedience does play a role in our righteousness. You can't do it without Yeshua, but you can't be righteous without obedience either. The two go hand in hand. So obedience to what? Where's Paul getting this teaching? Well, it's Deuteronomy chapter 6, like I said, verse 24. And Yahweh commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear Yahweh our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before Yahweh our God as he commanded us. So it's part of the process. It's not the complete part, but it is part of it. This scripture is forever settled in heaven. It's as true today as it was when it was written thousands of years ago. Now, John gives us some valuable insight. Remember, Paul talked about sin leading to death and obedience leading to righteousness. What is sin biblically? First John 3, 4, whoever commits sin transgresses also the law for sin is the transgression of the law. There you have it. You throw out the law. You're a sinner because you're not keeping it anymore. And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Skipping to verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. Little litmus test here he gives us. So John tells us that sin is the transgression of Yahweh's Torah. And that whoever practices this violation is of the devil. Now, Paul gives us that same definition, Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. He gives us a second witness in Romans 7. What shall we say, then, is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the Torah. So with this understanding of the importance of our Father's Torah, Let's look at the gospel that Yeshua actually taught, the gospel that we are to teach all nations. Now, John has done the most complete job out of all of the gospels in showing us that what Yeshua taught was required for salvation. John 3, Yeshua answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Now, this is the key. They understood the phrase born again in Judaism. When a, when a man-child was born, 
he wasn't given his name on the first day. Eight days later, he would be circumcised and given his, his name. That was a born-again experience. When he would grow up in Judaism, reach the age of 13, that when they bar mitzvah them, they'd say they're sons of the commandments, even though it's not biblical. In Judaism, that's considered a born-again experience. When the son grows up and learns a trade and becomes a tradesman, a craftsman, that's a born-again experience. Or if he decides to go into the yeshiva and become a rabbi, that's a born-again experience. Nicodemus is old, though. He's past all these stages in life. He's going, what are you talking about? I mean, I understand the born-again thing, but I'm old. Can I go back into my mother's womb and be born again? What are you talking about? He's, he's dumbfounded here. Can one enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yeshua answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he's contrasting flesh and spirit here. So being born of water, it's not talking about baptism necessarily. It's talking about being born out of a bag of waters. We're all born out of waters. We're all physical. But we have also, also all have to be born again if we want to expect to make it. So in the new covenant, the standards have actually been raised. The righteousness from obedience is still required. But now in the new covenant, he explains or he gives us the ability to live at a higher standard. And Ezekiel explains the primary purpose for the born-again experience. In Ezekiel 36, starting at verse 26, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. He's talking about the born-again experience. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments to do them. Remember, we read that earlier. It's all about the statutes and the judgments. This is what the Holy Spirit is going to cause us to walk in when we're born by his spirit and we're taught properly. Now, a lot of us came out of Christianity where we didn't do these things, but yet he was merciful enough that we saw in the Bible and the limited knowledge we have that this was the Yeshua, the Jesus that we wanted, and, and we were born again out of mercy. But now he's bringing us to being able to discern spirits because we're getting close to the end and without an understanding of his Torah, we're not going to be able to discern the spirits because there's going to be supernatural occurrences on both sides and we've got to be able to know who's of Yahweh and who's not. Otherwise, we're going to be deceived. In Matthew 24, he says that if those, less those days were shortened, even the very elect would be deceived because it's going to be very deceptive. So this is what Paul is referring to in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, obedience again, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So it's God in us now. He's given us the desire and the ability to walk in his Torah by his Holy Spirit. So our Father's good pleasure has not changed from the Old Covenant in to that in the New. Our ability to obey is what has changed. The New Covenant, we get the Holy Spirit. We are fused with the Creator. We have His Spirit within us now. The power is there. Now Yeshua goes on to further explain in John 5, verse 45, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you would have believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? You can't even believe Yeshua without knowing Moses, is what he's saying. Because Moses gives the context for understanding the Messiah. So if you don't believe Moses, how are you going to believe Yeshua? You're going to come up with a different Jesus if you're not careful. So Yeshua tells us that his words must be understood in the context of what he gave through Moses. Acts 7, again, this is the verse I was talking about, the angel. Verse 37, this is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who is in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. So Yeshua was this angel that gave us the living oracles that was with Moses in the wilderness didn't go by the name of Yeshua yet. Every time they would ask the angel, what is your name? He would say, why do you ask? Seeing it's wonderful or something like that. He never would give him his name. Not until Paul on the road to Damascus. It's the same angel doing the same kind of thing he did before. But now he says, I am Yeshua whom you persecuted. Now he gives his name. So Yeshua is the angel of Yahweh that walked with Adam in the cool of the day, who wrestled with Jacob and named him Israel, who came and ate with Abraham. 
Now remember, nobody can see the face of God and live. This had to be some kind of a sh limited form. But it says Yahweh in Hebrew. It says Yahweh came and ate with Abraham. Well, it's the angel of Yahweh who actually did it, the representative, Yeshua. Yeshua is the one who gave us the Torah through Moses. Now, there's a process to the born-again experience that Yeshua tells us that we must experience and explains this process in John 14. Starting out, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is the first step in salvation. This is true repentance. This demonstrates the life in the Torah. John 14, 16, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. This is after you love him and pledge to keep his commandments, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Now, why is it so important to love him and keep his commandments first? Because it guarantees that you're going to get the right spirit. Because his spirit's going to lead you continually into obedience to his Torah. The other spirit, the lawless spirit, leads you away from that. It says, ah, it was nailed to the cross. You don't have to do that anymore. It's all about grace now. There's some dangerous spirits out there. There's another Jesus with another spirit he warns us about in 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. The spirit of truth, that's the one we want, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you. And will be in you. That's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. He was with us before, and in the new covenant, he's going to be in us. We're going to be fused together with him, one with the creator, echad. That's what that word up there means, is one. But it's a complex, it's a masculine plural word in Hebrew. It's a complex one. Yahid is the Hebrew word that means one and one only, a singular one. But echad is like Elohim. Elohim is the word in Hebrew for God, but it's a masculine plural, and it includes the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, basically, so... So we are echad with him as well. So this is when we are actually born again, when his spirit comes to dwell inside of us. Now, please notice the order of the events. We have to first decide to love Yeshua. Then we have to commit to obeying his instructions contained in his Torah and elaborate it on with the rest of Scripture. Then the Father gives us his Holy Spirit, and now we're born again, born of his spirit. John 14, 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Yeshua is the Holy Spirit. That's how he comes to us. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you and me and I and you were fused together as one. One with the Father, one with Yeshua, seated with him in heavenly places, equal heirs with Yeshua, loved just like he loves Yeshua. We're now part of him. So here, Yeshua reveals that he comes to us in the form of the Holy Spirit. When this happens, we'll know that we're born again, that we're one with the Creator. His Spirit bears witness as well. John 14, 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. This is how we prove it. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So Yeshua again explains that our obedience to his Torah demonstrates our love for him and for the Father. And it's required for us to grow in him through personal manifestations and also reveals that this endears the Father's heart for us as well. When we're pressing in, we're wanting all of him, and we're walking in obedience, that really attracts the Father to us. When we reject him and reject his commandments, we saw how his anger turned towards his children, and he says, I'm going to provoke him with a nation that's not a nation. I mean, you can tick off the father. We need to be careful not to do that. It's not good. John 14, 22. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Yeshua answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. This is how we prove it. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, which means me and my father won't come and make our home in him then. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father who sent me. Yeshua is not preaching his own opinion. He is the prophet like Moses. He is speaking the words of the father. So Yeshua expands the process further. It's not just Yeshua who comes to live in us when we're born again. It's the father as well. He also reveals that to prove that we do not love him, that we prove it when we don't keep his commandments contained in his Torah. Now, Yeshua again reveals the life in the Torah in Matthew 19, verse 16. And behold, one came to him and said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? This is the question that they were really curious about. 
because there's all kinds of different teachings out there. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, they had different opinions, and so did the Essenes and everybody else involved. So they want to know what this rabbi says. And he said unto him, Why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and it didn't change just because he went to the cross and died for us. It's the same as it was back then. Now, this account's related in Mark 10, 17 through 18, and also Luke 18, 18 through 20 as well. Yeshua is revealing a truth that has been mostly stolen from Christianity by not understanding what Paul wrote. Paul appears to have a different method of salvation from the New Covenant. But if we look at where he gets his teaching from, we can see that he's teaching what Yeshua taught. In Romans 10, 4, it says, But the law has found its fulfillment in Messiah, so that all who have faith will be justified. But if you have faith, you're going to be born again, and then you're going to keep the law. Moses writes of the saving justice that comes by the law and says that whoever complies with it will find life in it. Now, in the King James, it says whoever does it will live by it or something like that. It almost makes it sound bad and like it's a bondage thing, but this is a true translation of the Greek. Whoever complies with it will find life in it. It's his living word. My words are spirit and they are life. But the saving justice of faith says this, Do not think in your heart, who will go up to heaven, that is to bring Messiah down, or who will go into the depths, that is to bring Messiah back from the dead. What does it say then? The word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart that is the word of faith which we preach. That if you declare with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord, and if you believe with your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. It is by believing with the heart that you're justified and by making the declaration with your lips that you're saved. So we have to do that part. That's the word in the Greek, homo legeo, for say, if we confess that he's Lord. It's not just the, the simple Greek word for say or speak. That's the word lego. But it comes from the classical Greek in a courtroom setting, one that's going to testify. You are confessing. You are swearing under oath, basically, that Yeshua is my Lord. It's not just something flippant. You are publicly testifying. That he's my master. So that's required. But then this other part doesn't make a lot of sense unless you go back to where Paul is actually getting it from. And it's in Deuteronomy chapter 30, starting at verse 8. And once again, you will obey the voice of Yahweh your God, and you will put all his commandments into practice, which I am laying down for you today. Yahweh your God will make you prosper in all your labors, in the offspring of your body, in the yield of your cattle, and in the yield of your soil. For once again, Yahweh will delight in your prosperity, as he used to take delight in the prosperity of your ancestors, if you obey the voice of Yahweh your God by keeping his commandments and decrees written in the book of this Torah. And if you return to Yahweh your God with all your heart and all your soul, for this law which I am laying down for you today, it is neither obscure for you nor beyond your reach. It's not in heaven, so that you need to wonder who will go up to heaven for us to bring it down for us, that we can hear it and practice it. And Paul adds that is to bring Messiah down from above. Because the Torah and Messiah are one. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you need to wonder who will go across the sea for us and to bring it, to it back to us so that we can hear it and practice. And Paul says that is to bring Messiah back from the dead. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to put into practice. That is the word of faith which Paul preached. But he just included Messiah into that as well. He wasn't preaching disobedience. He was pulling this right out of the Torah and elaborating on it and showing how Yeshua is the fulfillment of Torah and that You've got to embrace not just Torah, but the Torah made flesh. That's what Paul is pointing out. Look, verse 15, today I am offering you life and prosperity, death and disaster, if you obey the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I am laying down for you today. If you love, Yah love Yahweh your God and follow his ways, if you keep his commandments, his laws, and his customs, you will live and grow numerous. And Yahweh your God will bless you in the country which you are about to enter and make your own. But if your heart turns away, if you refuse to listen, if you let yourself be drawn into worshiping other gods and serving them, I tell you today, you will most certainly perish. You will not live for long in the country which you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. Today, I call heaven and earth to witness against you. I am offering you life 
or death, blessing or curse. Choose life then so that you and your descendants may live. This is an open book test and it gives us the answers. But we still have to choose. In the love of Yahweh your God, obeying his voice, holding fast to him, for he is your life. And we do it through obedience by the spirit. It's got to be by the spirit. That's the key. Spirit and truth. So as we can see, Paul was not trying to come up with a different way of salvation. He was explaining that Yeshua is the Torah and that obedience to Yeshua must include obedience to his instructions contained in his Torah. In the beginning was the word, the Torah. The word was with God. The word was God. Yeshua and his Torah cannot be separated. May we all be blessed in our pursuit of his instructions. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for the honor of being born of your spirit, of being one with you, one with Yeshua, your sons and your daughters. Thank you, Father, that you have removed the blindness, that you have opened our eyes to love your Torah, to understand your Torah, to understand that it's all about love by your definition, that we can love you. Everything we do in word or in deed, we can do is unto you through love, the motive of love. We don't obey to try to earn our salvation. We obey because you have already saved us. You have already made us new creations, and we do it as a result of loving you. We want to please you, Father. We want to do what is pleasing in your sight because we love you. Not because we're in fear of going to hell, although that could be a real fear, but it's a motive of love. We thank you, Father, for shedding your love abroad in our hearts by your Holy Spirit, for teaching us your ways, for redeeming our lives from destruction. Father, you have made us a kingdom of priests, and I thank you for the blessing on your people, Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh, Vayishmarecha. Ya'er Yahweh, Panave lecha, Vihunecha. Yesa Yahweh, Panave lecha, Vayasim lecha, Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. We are dismissed.